Distinguished guests, dear colleagues, students, friends, you've uh, shown up in big numbers today. Thank you very much. <laughs> Welcome to the China debate. My name is Michelle Hawkes, and I'm the director of the SOAS China Institute. 各位来宾、朋友们、同学们，晚上好！欢迎参加本年度中国辩论会。我是伦敦大学亚非学院中国研究院院长，我叫米肖·霍克斯。下面我将简单的用英文介绍今天晚上的活动安排和内容。The South China Institute organizes this annual China debate because we want to encourage conversations and discussions between China experts from different backgrounds and different communities, academia, business, government, NGOs, the media. We strongly believe that we can bring together a unique array of voices and a uniquely diverse range of opinions on China. This year, we celebrate SOAS's first centenary. It is fitting upon reaching such a milestone to take time to look back and ponder on how our past has shaped our present and will continue to shape our future. For China, too, 2016 is a year of many anniversaries and commemorations of events and movements linked to the country's revolutionary development. Today's panel discussion is devoted to an exchange of opinion about the remnants of revolution that continue to impact upon China. We are delighted to have as our panel moderator Ms. Carrie Gracie, the BBC China editor. Carrie's reporting from and about China has, I firmly believe, set new standards for TV journalism about the country, introducing BBC viewers all over the world to many different aspects of China, and doing so in a tone and with an open-mindedness that sets her apart from many of her colleagues. And apologies to those colleagues if they happen to be in the room. <laughs> Joining Carrie on the panel are Professor Barbara Mittler from the University of Heidelberg, who's an expert on modern Chinese culture and the author of an award-winning, highly revisionist study of the culture of the Cultural Revolution. Next to Professor Mittler, Mr. Gordon Orr, senior advisor to McKinsey, board member of Lenovo and Swire Pacific, and a highly influential analyst of and blogger about China's economic development. And last, but by no means least, Sir David Tang, highly prominent member of the UK and Hong Kong business communities, supporter of the arts and many other good causes, and most recently founder of the China Exchange, a wonderful space for debate and discussion right in the middle of London's Chinatown, devoted to the same kind of dialogue that we hope to foster here tonight. And I'm proud to announce that the SOAS China Institute's centenary exhibition will take place in the China Exchange next year. The event today will follow the so-called question time format, focusing on Q&A and discussion. And there will be ample opportunity during the second half of the event for audience participation. You may be rowdy. <laughs> for now, however, I'm delighted to hand over to our moderator, and I ask that you please join me in welcoming her and the other panelists. Thank you, Michelle, and uh, great to see everybody here tonight. It's exhilarating to be with such a distinguished panel and such a large, assembled China brain, as I can see out there in front of me. Uh, journalists, academics, diplomats, people who've grown up in China. Um, you're all going to, over the next hour, 90 minutes or so, demonstrate that we together are more than the sum of our parts when it comes to enriching our understanding of this amazing civilization. So please take part. Um, we're going to start with a panel discussion up here, but then I want you all to speak your minds, uh, whether you agree, whether you disagree, whether you think someone's spoken our nonsense, please speak up. Um, keep it polite, though, because although Michelle says we may be rowdy, we are podcast, and so for the sake of online viewers and listeners and uh, other people in the room, no swearing, no brawling, please. Um, <laughs> But other than that, let's just get on with it, I think. So first up, we're going to have three minutes 
uninterrupted from each of our panelists, and then we're going to brainstorm up here for a few minutes uh, on the ideas that each of them come up with. We got into a huddle in the green room back there about who was going to go first, and, um, <laughs> and there much. wasn't much enthusiasm for going first, I have to say, but we, we decided to make Gordon go first. Gordon, it's up to you. You have three minutes. I'm going to put some nice Chinese chimes on my phone to time you, just so that it doesn't sound like I'm being rude when I stop you. Okay, I'm going to go. time, time myself to keep you on. <laughs> um, I'd like to start with um, a couple of thoughts on trade and uh, economic revolutions. Um, and we, you know, Michelle was talking about anniversaries, and I think if we stretch it a little bit, it's somewhere close to 850 years since Marco Polo showed up in, in Beijing. Um, and you know, that was one of the first instances of, of China <coughs> trade causing disruption around the rest of the world. Um, you know, even in the time of the Romans, they were worrying about the trade deficit with China and trying to block Chinese imports. Um, slightly differently, though, from today, it was China that was protecting the IP and Europe that was trying to steal it at that point, um, something that's reversed a little bit in, in recent years. But we did see the creation of Silk Route infrastructure echoed around what we're, what we're seeing uh, under the, the, the new initiatives against the Silk Road today. Uh, it was asset, it was capital light at that point in time. Today, it's very capital heavy. And we've seen, I think, through the years, the decade, the centuries, um, the ambivalence of China towards foreign companies operating in China. And we've seen eras of extreme openness to encourage transfers of technology and intellectual property. And we've seen eras that step back from that, whether it's through forcible removal or incremental throttling down. And I think we're seeing some of that incremental throttling down again today, whether it's around you know, Apple's results, as we saw yesterday in pharmaceuticals, and baby food and light, you see foreign companies succeeding for a period of time, and then their market position diminishing. <laughs> As importantly, coming to the present date, I'd like to talk to the economic revolution that started in 1991, when Zhu Rongji took on the ec economic portfolio in China. Then it was a time of political crisis, as Shambo would say, hard authoritarianism, of high inflation, of essentially a bankrupt state, tax revenue was less than 10% of GDP. The economic crisis was clear. The levers to pull were simple, strong, <coughs> and pulled very, very rapidly. There was a crisis, it was addressed, it laid the foundations for 20 years, 25 years of economic transformation. It enabled the export economy, it put the path of infrastructure, modern infrastructure in place, uh, it stripped out the bad debt from the banks, um, and but it did repress the consumer. It repressed consumer consumption for most of the next 25 years. Where we are today, oh. very good. Where we are today <laughs> is to finish the sentence. We need an equip. It's like I've started, so I finished. You're Isn't committed. That still happening? Um, that we're at a point where we need an equivalent scale of revolution economically to enable China's economy to grow to be more consumer driven, to have market allocation of capital and a number of other things that we may, may touch on in greater detail later, but without the overarching political crisis to, to, to enable it. And I think the big challenge today and the big question is to what extent will the leadership, whether it's this year, next year, or the year after, be able to face up to this challenge and set in role the new revolution on, a, on, on the economic dimensions that China and Chinese society and Chinese middle class really needs. Thank you. So in a way, Gordon, you were saying, sorry, sorry, I should let everyone applaud there. <laughs> But I wanted to ask, so in a way you're saying Jurongji was a closet revolutionary and we need another. I think we should have an enormous number of statues to Jurongji all around China. And the question is, who's going to be alongside him from his, this generation, if anyone? So David, who's alongside? <coughs> well, I thought it was Mao's, um, uh, Deng Xiaoping who actually led the way. Um, but uh, 
perhaps there ought to be more statues of him than Zhu Rongji. Without Deng Xiaoping, I don't think Zhu Rongji would have succeeded most of the things he did. This is like the fantasy football team, isn't it? Isn't it? The, 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 the fantasy revolutionary team for the next stage of China. Barbara, who's on your team? <laughs> None of these. <laughs> None of these. <laughs> I think Xi Jinping is going to make it. And I'm going <laughs> to, and the reason is the following. I'm going to sing it to you. No, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not making this up. This is a song that was nicely, very nice, and I was going to put it on screen, but for some reason it's not possible to put it on the screen. Anyway, there's a beautiful, and you can uh, look it up in YouTube, uh, just look up Dong Fang Hong new version, Xi Jinping, and you will find it. Um, it's the new The East is Red. And it just came out in March, so it's, it's very, very recent. And it, is, it sort of proves that the king is dead, long live the king, has finally arrived in China. Because basically, since Mao died, I would say, and remnants of revolution, since Mao died, nobody made it to become the king. Mao still hangs on Tiananmen Square, but maybe soon it'll be Xi Jinping. Um, Hua Gofeng didn't make it. Deng Xiaoping didn't make it. Zhu Rongji is not in that <laughs> field anyway. <laughs> Jiang Zemin, Hu Jintao, none of these made it, but Xi Jinping is trying. I don't know whether he's going to succeed, but at least he has sort of culture on his side, a remnant of a revolutionary culture that is a very, 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 very strong culture. Why is it so strong? Because it was sort of accompanied by political movements, and these move political movements, and especially the Cultural Revolution, but not only the Cultural Revolution, have impacted on almost everyone's lives. There is hardly anyone who hasn't been somehow impacted by this revolution. Even the kids that weren't born during the Cultural Revolution still get a lot of it in those nostalgia restaurants, in all of these internet museums that have been built, and so on and so forth. A cultural revolution culture, or the Chinese revolution, which is what I'm arguing. I don't think we can talk about cultural revolution culture, but that culture is actually one that goes back all the way into the uh, 1920s, 20s, 30s um, of the 20th century. That culture is so important that it will not go away. And so to think of socialism being dead in China, in spite of the fact that market economy is very much alive, is probably not the right way to think about it. So if we think about those dates that uh, Michelle also brought up earlier, 1916 was the date when uh, the attempt to create another monarchy was made. 1966 is the moment when Mao, the new king, the new emperor, uh, calls for a revolution that is supposed to topple all of the bureaucracy, including the emperor, perhaps. Um, 2016 is the moment, as I said, when the king is back, Xi Jinping. Um, in between, there are many, many moments, and I would want to draw your attention to the fact that the six dates, 1966 has something to do with 1969. 1986, the student movements, have something to do with 1989. 1996, the Zhongguo Kei Shuo Bu movement, the time when um, all these books came out that China can do without America, without the US, um, ends in 1999 with the bombardment of the um, uh, embassy, the Chinese embassy, and a, a sort of uproar in anti-American feelings, but only for a very, very short time. So all of these dates have a link to later dates and sometimes they go viral, and sometimes they go up. Anyway, so I have to stop. You do, and, um, and, and I suppose what you didn't have time to, to, to say, but I'm interested in pressing you for, is the answer for, is there a purpose beyond being the new king? Is there a purpose? It, does Xi Jinping have purpose? Is he trying to do Gordon's revolution? 
I think so. I think he's, uh, whether he's trying to do Gordon's revolution. <laughs> no. That's a, that's a new, 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 new branding. I've, I've he's, that. he's definitely trying to do a new kind of revolution. And what is the content if not, if not if, I mean, I know Gordon's revolution is not the generally agreed term in China, <laughs> but that structural, huge adjustment to build a modern economy, is that his purpose? That's one of his purpose. His purpose is Minzu Fuxing. That is a renaissance of the Chinese people. That's the Chinese dream. And that Chinese dream contains, and that's really, really important in the third <coughs> verse of this, this song, it's no longer, it's, it's no longer people's liberation, Renmin Jiefang, as in the old song, but it's Renmin Li Liang, the power of the people, of the Chinese people, of China as a country that he's out for. And that can be economic power, it's also political power. In that song, all of the um, images behind that third verse are of military equipment and all of these wonderful demonstrations of you know, Chinese equipment and uh, missiles and so on and so forth. So it's very clear what that power is all about. And, and Gordon, do you see Xi Jinping as the, as the man? Is that comprehensive power achievable by his kind of politics? I think it's more achievable with a, with a strong centralized leader who's clearly in control of all the levers of government. Uh, much more, it's much more readily doable today or 2017 after the, the, the next leadership shifts than it was in 2012 or 2011 with Hu Jintao and compromise and you know, consensual leadership. So David. Um, you want me to comment, or do yes, you want me to say? Yes, we're just brainstorming Barbara's. Uh, I totally disagree. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I will tell you why at the end of what I'm going to say, if I may. Uh, well, I shall I put your timer on? You yes, you can. Right. Yes. <laughs> will, will you follow? When, it? when, when the title was uh, presented to me, I thought about it, and I came to the conclusion that none of the remnants of revolution in China was Chinese. <laughs> and uh, it's complete nonsense to think that in the last century, uh, where China underwent um, one of the most tumultuous moments in, in her entire 4,000 year history. Why? Well, first of all, 1912, it became a republic. I mean, it's unheard of. If, um, if somebody told uh, somebody at the turn of the century it was going to be uh, ruled by democracy and there was going to be a republic, the emperor was going to go. Um, and even, in fact, the last Qing dynasty, that they, they weren't even Han Chinese. They were already foreigners. And my thesis here is that the foreign and the Western influence in China has actually caused all the revolutions in China, and we've got to watch it. Now, in 1912, <laughs> we've got democracy, never heard of before, republicanism, never heard of before. Sun Yat-sen came along, and he wanted to do Henry, uh, land reform as well, a bit of Henry George. And then suddenly, uh, you have Chiang Kai-shek, who was a bit of a traitor in my mind, but he went off to Taiwan, and he was a very good capitalist, because, you know, the half of um, the uh, city in San Francisco, what's that called, Silicon Valley, was, was probably because of Taiwan, and Taiwan uh, became, I think, the sec second largest country with the hugest reserve at, at one stage. He was a very good businessman. And, um, and then, of course, Mao, uh, who changed China totally with Marxism, you know, the man who's buried not so far away from here. And um, so suddenly I thought, wait a moment, um, we, we've got all these theories, what I call Henry Kissinger theory of China being an incredible country of history of 5,000 years going back to Confucius. But actually, he doesn't talk like that to Iraq, not to Iran or Egypt. Uh, many civilizations have actually got as long a history as, as China as, as respectable. The point I'm making is that communism in 1949, October 1, actually became the summit of the conversion of the Chinese culture uh, and is corrupted, if that's the right word, um, by Western precept, Karl Marx, socialism. Now, even before that, when Chiang Kai-shek started his Kuomintang 
um, um, uh, uh, government in the 30s, uh, he also asked the Germans to, to come and help them uh, to build the military, just like the Menju Revolution in, in Japan, you know, 100 years before. And now Deng Xiaoping came along, and what does he want? He wants to introduce capitalism. Well, there it is. This is the power today. And I want to say that there are two other things very quickly. What is happening is that the internet in the world today, which is also brought about by Western civilization in a large way, is going to be the challenge for the revolution. And the greatest challenge of all is propaganda. From October 1, we have propaganda as a revolution, the silent revolution, which has got to be put down. And I don't think that Xi Jinping, not even Xi Jinping, can come and, uh, and, and become the silencer of that, which he tried to do with the media and, and so forth. And uh, I think it's inevitable that actually China, whether we like it or not, is going to be become more and more non-Chinese, un-Chinese, and is going to be more and more Western. Uh, I'm not saying whether it's a good thing or not, but that's the view I have. That's the revolution we've got to contain. If we want a great China, we might have to accept the Western resolution, revolution in this world of globalization. Well, thank you all. That's lots to digest and lots to pick apart. Let's, let's just, seeing as that's freshest in our minds, um, the question of all dangerous revolutions coming from outside China, well, in a way, that would explain Xi Jinping's concern about hostile foreign forces at the moment, wouldn't it? But you can't change history. He wants to make... Look, the whole anti-corruption um, movement was to pacify the population of China into believing that things are actually going to change socially. Tiananmen Square was not about democracy, it was about corruption, it was about social injustice. And what Xi Jinping came to do was absolutely correct. If I were him, I would have done the same thing. But what has he got to put down in terms of anti-corruption? Now remember, Jiang Ziming in 2009 became president. He did one thing which completely changed modern China. He assumed the power of the chairmanship of the military commission and also became the head of the Communist Party. So suddenly, Jiang Ziming became the absolute leader. And if there was anybody who qualified for a portrait, it would be Jiang Ziming, because he not only ruled for two terms, he extended it for three years, he ruled for 13 years, and when Hu Jintao came along, it's well known that he was the, still the power behind the throne. So we're talking about 18 years of the Shanghai Mafia with the PLA, the largest employer in the world, uh, next to the NS, uh, NHS, by the way, uh, two million people, 18 years of systematic corruption. That's what <laughs> Xi Jinping has got to deal with. And there are 8 million people in jails now. I don't think it's a very easy task. And if you ask me, I think trouble is brewing. So, so just pursuing the thought, though, you said that dangerous revolutions come from outside China, the revolutions that topple. Not dangerous. But, but I'm just stating a fact. It's not dangerous. It's how China has been shaped in the last 120 no, years. No, but the, but so obviously, from the Communist Party's perspective, that is a, you know, any toppling of existing regime is dangerous to them, right? So, so d does he face a greater danger from within, from the 80 years of corruption that you're talking about, or does he face a greater oh, danger from within? That's why he's got the problem. That's why I disagree with uh, the professor in her marvelous Chinese garb and uh, wonderful <laughs> sing-song voice. Uh, is, is, it's, no, it's not Shanghai Tang. Get off the stage. <laughs> <laughs> So just finish the point. That's why, you di that's why you disagree with Barbara. Uh, yes. I mean, ha yeah. Not twice. Not because of what she's wearing. Twice, no, twice as much. Because I think also, look, has anybody told me how any decision of the Chinese government has ever been made since 1949, October 1? There are usually about seven or nine members of a standing committee of the Politburo. Not one person has ever spoken, has ever given, opened the lips. I think Bao Xili was about to do so, and he was immediately clamped down. 
what we don't know is what goes on in the minds of the, all these people who come across these decisions. But all I can tell you is that the anti-corruption, even the anti-corruption process, which defines what is going on in China today, is a very, very dangerous process because you are dealing with the remnant of 18 years of systematic corruption singularly, just even the PLA alone of two million people. Just think of the scale of that. Where do you think all the billionaires come from? Where do you think why Hong Kong is the biggest Chinese laundry in the world? <laughs> How is it possible that any of this money, when you cannot send more than 5,000 yuan out of the country, where did it come from? I mean, uh, you know, Wentworth, of course, is, is, is owned by Chinese. Uh, Trinity Square is owned by Chinese. Uh, the taxis are owned by Chinese. Uh, the buses are uh, owned by Chinese. Where do you think this money comes from? When, in fact, since 1949, you couldn't even remit money out. Barbara. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Xi Jinping is the new monarch with, you know, every power and every song to gladden our hearts, but how is he going to deal with these problems? <laughs> That, I don't know. <laughs> but I was going to say, I think you're completely wrong saying that these revolutions have all come from the West. At least they have Zhongguo Tese. But if you, I mean, I'm always in, in this conversation and with- What's uh, Chinese characteristics? Chinese characteristics. Um, I mean, no, 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 <laughs> I, I know. Oh, I, but, no, the one is east, one is west. The reason why I'm saying this is like Mao Zedong has always been accused, and I think rightly so, that he hasn't really read his marks, that he was much more interested in reading drums and other such things and writing poetry in the style of tongue poets and so on and so forth than actually studying his Marx. And so to say that his revolution, which really is not a Marxist revolution, is the dangers that come along with it is something imported from outside. I find very difficult. It's socialism. It's socialism, yes. When, it's, it's when has so socialism ever presented <laughs> itself in China 4,000 years of dynastic history? Can I ask a different question? Communism. Getting, 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 Tell me. Getting slightly away. Where has it come from? I'm not talking about the West. The, 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 the revolution is not coming from the West. Western ideas. Very important difference. Western ideologies. That's why they still wear suits when they come to have state visits. They don't wear Mao jackets. <laughs> they love Western things. So, so Barbara, do you accept Sir David's argument that disruptive, innovative ideas are coming from outside China, basically? Oh, I absolutely disagree. Because I think, you know, the Western... No, not outside China, sorry. I, I, Western <laughs> ideas. Not, I'm not talking about somebody's, the CIA or the, or the MI6 is sort of propping up, uh, you know, people, uh, <laughs> not that they can. I'm talking about the whole concept. You can't get away from the fact that communism or socialism with Chinese characteristic, yawn, yawn, that is still a Western precept. The idea of an egalitarian state where people Standards well, are lifted. And you've finished that point. You get an answer, and then I've got to put this to the floor. Uh, we're going to take a, we're going to take a show of hands on who agrees with who here. But, but oh, Barbara okay, gets to okay. say uh, you get to you get to. Well, I just want to say something on the suit, and then also on my not very <laughs> shy <laughs> tongue. But anyway, I think I mean going with Zhang Zhidong, who is an official in the 19th century, who was saying Zhong Wei Ti Xi Wei Yong. So Chinese is sort of the tool. Uh, no, no, the Western thing is the tool and the Chinese is the substance. Um, this really, I mean, is happening, for example, with the suit. In the beginning, in the early 20th century, you wear a suit for certain, as a Chinese, you wear a suit for certain occasions because you want to make a point. Um, but you wear your Chinese gown for other occasions also because you want to make a point. But by now, you know, wearing a suit is just maybe more apt or more, more comfortable, more, you know, wearing jeans, I should have probably said, more comfortable, more whatever. And there is no ideology attached anymore to the jeans, except 
other types of ideologies. But, but Barbara, answer the, the underlying point, which was that, that all of the big disruptive revolutionary ideas have come from the West that yes, have turned things upside but down I, in China. I, I, would, I mean, they have not come from the West. It's the Chinese taking them from the West and then doing something with them. That's but it was the difference, taking them from the West and coming from the West. Well, taking from the West, coming from the West. Coming from the West means I'm the West comes and gives waitress. you this and is you being mean. Let's hear from the no, you must <laughs> answer that. What's the difference between coming from the West and taking oh, from the West. Passive verbs, active verbs. I don't care. I want to hear from the audience now. So can we, can we just take a show of hands on who in this assembly thinks that... Um, how to phrase this so that, I'm, so that Sir David's not going to disagree with my vocab. Um, <laughs> that, that the big disruptive revolutionary ideas in China over the last, uh, over the last couple of centuries have predominantly come from the West. That's Sir David's view, as I understand it. And Barbara profoundly disagrees and says China takes them and does what it wants, but the ideas are coming from within. So who's for Sir David's argument? Hands up. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, yeah, we might you, have you to get... Go, we, you can go for... Yeah, you can I go think, for... Go, I think it, you I can think go it's for time, Gordon's revolution. I think Gordon's it's time revolution. to get to the audience. So uh, do we have a microphone? And <laughs> then we'll have a... Choice. So that's, that was Sir David's. It's hard to count, but I'd say maybe a third of the audience. How many people agree with Barbara that creative political ideas, big Possibly. revolutionary ideas in other ways are coming from within China? That, I'd say, is a smaller number of... A smaller it's number an of awful people. lot of people don't believe in voting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but there's also that potential that we haven't covered, <laughs> haven't covered the, various, the various options. I want, I want, I'd like to raise a, a question about this, but before I do that, I do think it's time to bring all of you in. So we've got microphones now, so if anyone has a question or a point they wanted to make, let's take the gentleman holding the pen in the blue top there. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> I'd like to turn the question around uh, 180 degrees, and we hear a huge amount about China's civilization. One of the characteristics of civilizations is that they spread far beyond, if they're powerful, far beyond the borders of the country in which they originate. <clears throat> Could anyone name, please, one I idea that has come out of China in the last hundred years that has swept the world? And I mean that in the Victor Hugo sense of nothing has a force like an idea whose time has come, and I don't count Maoism for exactly the reason that uh, David Tang uh, mentioned. Thanks for that question. Who would like to answer that? Um, we haven't heard from Gordon for a while. Let's go for Gordon. Well, I was going to go for the, the, um, the, I think, if we didn't have the foreign influence in the world of um, business and markets that we've had in China over the last 35 years, there would have been no, no Chinese miracle at all. You wouldn't have had the urbanization of the tens of millions, the GDP growth, the creation of the middle class and the like. And that came almost entirely from the adoption of foreign business methodologies and approaches and the acceptance of the, chi of, of the world that it would buy goods that were made in China. So it, I think to, the, to, to, to your question, I think the most, most impactful thing that has come from China over the last... 30, 35 years, is made in China. It's, ch it's changed not just Chinese society, it's changed, changed the world, changed our view of trade, it's created deflation around the world, it's made things cheaper for millions, if not billions of people. Um, it's created, you know, dis incredibly distorting at bubbles in energy and basic materials. And, you know, without really intending to, China, China's growth created a, a geopolitical, a geoeconomic impact that was way beyond anything that they were even considering happening. It just happened. Thank you, Gordon. Barbara. My examples are more historical, but they are also equally important. The um, examination system in France, for example, the civil examination system is a Chinese idea reformed and rechained in the same way, you know, it wasn't taken from China, but it was used by them in very creative ways. And this is the civil examination system that's still in place today. And that if you go to an Ecole Polytechnique, that's what you're going to be. I examined. think, Barbara, the question was within the last hundred years, was it? Yes, yes, but this, yep. you know, it's, this, that's what they do at the end of the 19th century. So it's within the last 
big hundred years, anyway. <laughs> then, the other thing that I think is really, really important in popular culture is the Zen of archery, the Zen of love, the Zen of cooking. Now, you were saying, okay, Zen, but that's Japanese. No, it's not. It's Chan Buddhism, it's Chinese. And so, you know, that, again, is something that has influenced so many of you, even without you knowing, and it's Chinese. David. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, you don't have to look at 100 years. In fact, I, 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 by your turning the question around, I would sing the praises. You just have to remember Confucius. Two things. Two things has changed the world. Born in 551, that's two and a half thousand years ago, and that has actually influenced the world in a major way. Number one, the examination system was taken entirely from the Chinese, not from the West. This is where I actually also disagree, but uh, in an opposite <laughs> direction. The idea of meritocracy, because the whole point about the imperial examination system was that anyone could sit for them and become a civil servant and go up the ladder. This idea of meritocracy is the first time that it was introduced in China. And we now talk about you know, whether blood or meritocracy a great deal. I mean, that argument came perhaps later with Muhammad, the difference between the Shi'is and the Sunnis. Uh, but 551 BC, Confucius says, let's have a meritocracy. Let's l people have equal chances. And the other thing he did was, of course, he wrote the first uh, anthology of poetry. And he was the first person to have collected poetry and demonstrating the beauty of human imagination. And so, actually, going back, these are the two absolute Chinese characteristics that actually uh, come through down to the earth and actually have affected every civilization in the world. Thank you, all three. Let's um, take another question. Um, down here, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And um, I, I am for the third choice, actually. <laughs> uh, you see, if we look at the history of modern China, by the way, by modern China, I mean from uh, 1840, the Opium War onwards, and we, we could see that uh, the ideas that are behind the changes, whether reformist or uh, revolutionary actually are from both within and without. From within, as we know that uh, the traditional, the gongyang thoughts of a Chinese traditional idea, that is uh, whenever the society is faced with problems, the gongyang idea would arise. And actually, the later Qing thinkers advocated and developed the gongyang ideas to a very, very high uh, rate. Um, and so th th this is definitely an idea for change and the reform. And actually, it is the backbone of the reformist thought in late Qing period. And uh, from the outside, we could see that after the Opium War, the heavy influence from the West, whether Marxism, whether the French Revolution, whereas Japan, the, okay, Japan is not the West, by the way, okay. <laughs> and they all come in and uh, they influence the Chinese thinkers tremendously, and uh, in, so much so that in late 1890s, the idea of a complete westernization was very much high on the minds of uh, some prominent reformist thinkers like Tai Si Tong, uh, even later on Liang Qichao, etc. However, I should also point out that uh, some other thinkers are very, very much warm, you know, warning uh, the Chinese against the disruptive revolutionary influences from the West, like Kang Youwei. He's very much against uh, the terrible disasters by French Revolution, and he always calls for, um, uh, you know, for watch out for similar effects that might happen in China. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, so, uh, one question that, in a way, arises off the back of that, which I would like to put, if everyone can um, forgive me, I'd like to put to the panel, is about the openness to feedback and discussion 
Because that was a period, as you were describing, in the late, the very end of the 19th century, when a lot of different ideas were being thrown about and discussed openly. However, there have been times in China's history where the feedback mechanism has not been open and discussion of ideas is, is not open. And that then feeds, I think, back into this question about whether China needs external corrections, all these foreigners coming in to give it ideas or revolutions. Is that a, is that a coherent way of, of putting it, David? It's, it's quite complicated. Mm. <laughs> as, in, as in looking at Xi Jinping's China, where journalists, academics, lawyers, labor activists, religious believers are being closed down and saying, only if you do it the way I tell you to do it, can you speak, you know, can you speak up? So that sense of a, a feedback mechanism has been closed down can China prosper in that way, or does it then have to have a major, violent, abrupt, sudden, extreme correction imposed from outside? No, uh, of course not. Uh, it's, it will be somewhere in between. With the internet today, we know today you can't get Google, you can't get, there's a firewall, but eventually, I don't think even the Chinese Communist Party could stop uh, the spread of information through cyberspace. And I think also what is sad about my country today is that there is a feeling of a soft reign of terror. Um, people are not happy. And they're not happy because there is a total disconnect between the citizen and government. There is absolutely no bridge between the two. And if you talk about the rule of law, 98% of cases that are presented to the courts are found guilty. It goes against the human sense of fairness and justice. Now, all I say is that I don't know how it's going to happen, but I hope certainly that here is a great country with a tremendous history, and somewhere along the line, you've got to free the people individually so that they can relate to a government. Now, the government might not be set entirely good. Lots of countries have bad governments and, and so forth, but they've got to relate to it and not live in fear. Now, you know, we had the reign of terror phrase from the French Revolution, but it's a soft reign of terror. It's not as if you go into, um, 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 uh, into China and you suddenly thought, Christ, you know, we're going to be arrested. But it's there. Last month, I was in Shanghai. I went up to the immigration counter, and he was looking around. He was doing all sorts of things. I said... Christ, have I done anything wrong? Have I said anything wrong? Am I going to say something wrong in so as? Do they already <laughs> know what I'm saying? And the, 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 the officer went like this. And of course, there were about three people who were detained over there, over that corner. So when he waved his arm, my heart actually sank. I looked around, and, um, and there were people there. And then he said, and I realized, thank God, it was the camera over there that he wanted to take my photograph. <laughs> so, huge relief, I got through. Now, as me, can you imagine what you would feel like if you were a citizen? Yeah, um, exactly. Um, <laughs> Gordon and Barbara. But it's, that's very, very true that the reign of terror, the soft reign of terror um, functions by unpredictability. And I think Ai Weiwei is a very, very good example. He's been doing critical art for years and years and years, for decades and decades and decades. He was in that period while he was doing all this critical art. He became the state artist by building the bird's nest or by being the sort of uh, artistic director of the building of the bird's nest. And then just a few years later, suddenly he's detained. Nobody really knows why. I mean, it's then for corruption, whatever, crazy reasons that have nothing to do with the fact why he was detained. But um, this unpredictability, you don't know <coughs> when what you're going to do 
is going to hit you. That's how this government is so incredibly powerful, I think. That, that's how it so reigns through this fear that you never know, you never quite know how far you can uh, go. And, and going full circle yeah. to Gordon, your original idea about you know, the next stage of the economic revolution, can you do that stage of the economic re revolution while you're having the soft reign of terror that, that everybody's describing? It does make it hard. I mean, I think, it, you know, I'd call it sort of, it's, it's sort of governance by making examples. And, you know, it's sort of like ran randomly in the state-owned enterprise, which, which one-third of the leadership you decide to arrest and process through the system, and the other two-thirds then sits there and does nothing, waiting for the, for the next round to come. And we have to get out of that because people have to start Spend, spending and building and, 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 and the like. Uh, it's the same in, in the handling of multinationals. You know, we've had, had examples in pharmaceuticals and iron ore, British companies. It's, you know, it's, it's, you know who, who you choose to go after is it's often just the tallest poppy. And I think you're seeing it in, in mobile phones again now. If you're a foreign company selling close to $80 billion a year of product in China, you're pretty visible in, in, what, in what you do. Um, but you do have millions of, you know, 120 million people working in scale private enterprises in the cities in China today that are getting on and doing things and making money in the context that we're talking about. So, yes, there's constraints, it's, but it's one hand tied behind the back, it's not two. Let's take some more questions. Um, down here with the... James. Down there. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, David Tang's remarks prompt me to suggest that it might be interesting to explore Professor Mittler's nomination of Xi Jinping as the new <laughs> king or hero, uh, nomination given with apparent approval. Uh, this is a man, Carrie, that you've described as a paranoid control freak. Oh, did I? Yes. <laughs> 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 but I think the, the new version of Dong Fang Huang with uh, Xi Jinping as... Uh, <coughs> all that stuff uh, chimes with a whole lot of other things going on about Xi Da Da, the new great man, yes. the breakdown of consensus rule in China and its replacement by the rule of one supreme strong figure controlling not only the party but also through the party, the Central Military Commission. And, and I mean, one can go back to uh, 2013 and, and central document number, number nine, the seven unmentionables, you can't now discuss a whole range of things, including what we understand by the rule of law in the Chinese media or the Chinese press without risk of being fired or worse. So one has an impression that under the man described by Carrie, uh, <laughs> I won't repeat the description which you might want to disown, but oh, one no, has no. the impression that actually we're sliding back, harking back to Mao, a period of terrible destruction of Chinese lives and culture, harking back to Mao, sliding perhaps from authoritarian rule towards something pointing towards totalitarian rule, an attempt to control almost everything again. Not thankfully the way women dress or uh, the job that you choose, but a whole lot of other things, mm -hmm. including, including just about everything in the intellectual sphere. So I wonder, Professor, in the light of those rather long remarks, for which I apologize, whether you would care to defend your nomination. Barbara. A king can be very totalitarian. And so, you know, I, I don't think I want to defend it in any way because I, I wasn't saying that I'm glad about that. I'm just saying that this is what seems to be happening. So he is making himself into a king and a very powerful one and a very authoritarian one, I think. And he's using all kinds of registers. The Maoist, certainly, right? But also the classical. So that in his political speeches, the political speeches in every second line, you have a quote. And these quotes are really well used. So that, you know, if you want to really know what the political punch is of something that he is saying, you need to know the commentary, and not the douchey commentary, but you know the second or the third commentary in um, an edition, right, but of I, that I, classic. Sorry to interrupt, Barbara, but I think James was what he's driving at is the question: Are we returning to? I mean, we're sitting here 
you know, 50 years after the start of the Cultural Revolution or 40 years after the end of it with the death of Mao? Are we returning to a lost, a lost decade of that kind of hard rule of fear? Hard to say. I don't think it will be exactly the same, but there is a lot to be said for the kinds of policies um, that he's introducing are very similar to what Mao was doing in his time. Just to what the speaker said, he is intervening on how women dress. I mean, there's new guidelines in movies and on TV, so, you know. Even I, I, I was wondering, when, when we're thinking about this debate this evening, I, I had this thought about, you know, remnants of revolution was our, is our theme. And in my mind, I was thinking, where are the remnants of revolution present um, in, in Chinese life today? And I think one of the places arguably where they're very present is, is inside the head of Xi Jinping. You know, he is haunted in his night, dreams and nightmares, I suspect, by, you know, by some of the revolutions past. I mean, it's this week, 1644, was, you know, a Chinese emperor was hanging himself on a tree, we possibly believe, you know, at the back of the Forbidden City as the, as the Manchus arrived and as peasant re rebels um, took over. And that fear of the fate of the Ceausescus, the fate of Saddam Hussein, the fate of Muhammad Gaddafi, the fate of the Soviet Union, I mean, these are arguably, I put it to the other panellists, David, do you have a view on this, some of the remnants of revolution that sit inside Xi Jinping's head? Um, I describe it in another way, one word. Propaganda, I mentioned it before. What is propaganda? Propaganda is something that stops the natural functioning of the human body. We have our eyes to see, we have our ears to hear, we have our mouth to speak, our hands to do, and feet with which to walk. Propaganda is to indoctrinate you so that you only see certain things with your eyes. You only hear certain things with your ears. You only say certain things that is permissible. You can only do certain things with your hands and you can only go somewhere which is limited. That is the remnant of revolution that comes directly from a totalitarian state and unless that is dispersed, China, I believe, will not have a place in the modern world where, in fact, the power against propaganda is growing, if not within China, outside China. Thank you all. Um, let's take some more questions. Um, Isabel. Thank you very much, Carrie. I just wanted to explore a little bit more what you think about how, how about power in China, what it is, how you get it, and how you exercise it. Because all the examples that Barbara has, has given, and I think we disagree with the resurgence of the personality cult, the chairman of everything, all that stuff we've been seeing for the last two or three years. But if you look at the ability to enact the third plenum reforms, we're, we're absolutely getting nowhere. So, so, you know, there are negative powers. You can, you know, if you wish, control the length of people's hair and what kind of clothes they wear. But this isn't a terribly useful power in China, it seems to me, today. And this, uh, you know, does Xi Jinping really have the power to persuade people that, that the people and the party are indeed one? I sort of doubt it. Um, and he certainly doesn't seem to have the power at present to do the, the things that Gordon believes are essential to the economy. So I think we could at least question this, this you know, we don't have to take Xi Jinping's propaganda at face value. I, and I, when I see this government jumping at shadows and closing down every little, you know, NGO that wants to advance women's rights or whatever it is, I think... Are they really that worried? Are they worried about all these small things? If so, it doesn't look very powerful to me. It looks deeply anxious. Thank you for that contribution. Let's take um, more, and let's go over to this side, thanks. I can just shout if that helps. <laughs> um, so shout. Because the topic is uh, China remnants <coughs> of, of revolution. I think we sometimes tend to overlook um, developments within China that counter the narrative that were being presented. 
And I just want to give you one example of the Cultural Revolution. Uh, so there is a play from Chanton. I think Sorry, can, I, can everyone hear? Because I'm just concerned. Can we get another mic down there, maybe? Um, just okay, now it seems to work. Okay, oh. there's a place in China, Shantou, um, the Museum of the Cultural Revolution, which I think even some of the Chinese friends here in the room don't know about. Uh, so if you go to Shantou and ask a resident, where is this museum of the Cultural Revolution, people don't know. But then some people know, and a cab driver took me there. It's actually on a hill, and it's a memorial site which commemorates uh, Red Guards that were killed towards the end of the Cultural Revolution by members of the People's Liberation Army. Now it's very curious, you would wonder why on earth is this place there, which no one knows about, but it, it does exist. So the story in a nutshell is that there's a, a party secretary, quite influential, who may have lost his son or a relative who was a Red Guard killed by the People's Liberation Army and who wants to comm commemorate the dead. And apparently Wen Jiabao went to the opening of this ceremony, which people don't talk about, which Chinese media doesn't report about, but it does exist. So I find it very curious that in a, in a country where the Cultural Revolution is being seen as 70%, or Mao having, you know, being 70% right and 30% wrong, a very weird kind of historical verdict on the Cultural Revolution, you can have a place like that, a kind of counter history. And there's even a statue of uh, Liu Shaoqi, uh, one of the, the first president who actually starved to death during the Great Leap Forward, I think, in prison. So it's, it's a remarkable, um, I think, sign of Chinese resilience and willingness to have other narratives and historical memories uh, being preserved even within China. And I think that gives us maybe also a little bit of hope that um, despite the current uh, political winter that is um, uh, with us, that there's always this, um, this seed of hope for China's future. Because if you have these kind of small seeds, they can grow into a small tree and uh, uh, and can um, can prosper over time later on. Thank you very much for offering us a seed of hope. That's that's good. Um, now let's go up. I there. hardly think so. <laughs> yes, actually. I mean, if you think about the extrapolation of this amoebic place, uh, I mean, it's fantastic. And anywhere that Wen Jiabao visited, I don't think is very important. <laughs> And also, you know, it's really important to think about whenever there were moments of opening, like 1956, you have the Hundred Flowers movement, and immediately comes the anti rightist movement afterwards. 1986, you have all these student demonstrations, and immediately afterwards comes Tiananmen, 2016. So your hope is crushed. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, so I wonder what's coming. Let's go up to the top. Um, but Carrie, if I could on the power point, because I think it's a... There's, there's a couple of conflicting things going on. I think with, with quite a lot of m policy announcements that come out from the mid-level today, people are actually, the mid-level officials are actually trying to second guess, what do I, what, what am I intended to do? Um, and you know, it seems like quite a, some, some of this sort of uh, media censorship of what can be shown of, and, and those kind of the banning of you know, Doctor Who to Big Bang Theory to South Korean soap operas is mid-level folks trying, try, trying to curry favor. The second is the, conf the, the challenge of the conflicting goals. Because if you're a government official or a head of a state-owned enterprise, you know, you, you've got a set of KPIs that are more rigorously enforced than you know, any, any, any of us working in a, in a business in the UK. Um, but they're not, they're not mutually consistent anymore. And you have to make a choice of which one I'm going to pursue. And you know, generally, you'll do the one that has the least risk of negative consequence down the road. And you know, that's why we're seeing the seizing up of, of capital investment in China today, because it's better seen to be better not to spend. Because no, up till now, no one's shouted at me for not spending, but lots of people have shouted at me for spending the wrong thing. Can I also add something to what Isabel uh, made very good points about these shutting down of these uh, groups. Uh, one thing that the Communist Party is absolutely afraid of, absolutely afraid of, is growing of cliques. That's why Falun Gong is uh, outlawed. Uh, they decided to start the Confucian system, uh, foundation, and then suddenly realized that too many people, they had a very good relationship 
improving relationship with the Vatican until they realized that there were far many uh, Catholics growing. Then they slapped that down. So the moment they see something which was growing, they fear. Now, uh, Hu Jintao, when he left office, he actually published in his last year of presidency the number of public protests consisting of 50 people or more. And in one year, there were 87,000. He actually published it. And therefore, it, it is a very good point that that's what they want to clamp down. They want to slap down the smallest tumor that appears in order for it not to spread. Uh, and because they don't want cliques, they don't want anybody to challenge the commoners' rule. Let's go back to, yes, yeah, sorry, you've got, Adrian. Yeah, hi. Um, I just wanted to get back to the theme and looking in broad terms from a Chinese context, revolution essentially means communist party rule. So for 30 years, the first 30 years, that was a mainly political uh, activity which was asserting control over the country. In order to salvage that from bankruptcy and, and maintain rule, uh, the Communist Party accepted uh, uh, economic reforms for 30 years. This is now at a, a point where we don't know what, if any, economic reforms are going to continue, but they've got a lot of money now. So the uh, viability of the uh, state to continue is no longer the question. <coughs> and it's also uh, brought into question the, the relationship of the rest of the world with China. Uh, so is Xi Jinping making a big gamble to say now is the time that China doesn't really have any uh, viable ideological uh, rivals in the rest of the world, but it's got a lot of money and it can assert its way both domestically and internationally, even if it fumbles, makes a few errors. Uh, and whilst doing that, can reform some of the institutions that have uh, shaped the rest of the global economy, global political structures, such as the United Nations, the IMF, the World Bank, um, uh, the relationships of, of the global and regional trading blocks. And it, does this mean that China is in a position now to make some mistakes, to, to assert uh, uh, control in a blunt way and get away with it? Because the rest of the world owes China so much, or China owes the rest of the world so much, that its debt problems mean that we're not really going to intervene or have the means to uh, interfere with their revolution in this next phase. Uh, do you mean so? So, do you mean that there, that this is a revolution that's going to take place on the world stage that they're going to conduct with no? Uh, that that your view is that they are going to achieve this? I believe that China is continuing a revolution because it's trying to change the stage, uh, change the uh, form of institutions within its own country and internationally to suit the leadership of China, uh, first and foremost, which doesn't feel imperiled, uh, despite the risks they're taking and that we've all identified. They've still got quite a few years and quite a bank balance to, to keep in power. And, and just and briefly, the do you think power. they're going to succeed domestically and internationally, or, or neither, or one or well, the other? Well, this is what I'd like to put to the, uh, to the panel. Tell because, me what you think uh, first. Uh, <laughs> well, well I, I think that China already is changing uh, global institutions, and that we're seeing a complete lack of uh, any kind of solidarity amongst uh, you know, the international community, which mumbles and complains and, and, and doesn't like it, but isn't actually doing anything effective to uh, fight back. Well, we've talked, let, let's, should we talk about the international aspect of the question, Things we've talked quite a bit about the domestic aspect. Um, Barbara, internationally changing the stage to suit itself using that huge um, wallet well, worth of money. I think what you're saying, I, I totally agree. I think maybe the world revolution is going to come, the communist world revolution, and it's going to come from China. Um, but it, that's, the, the question is what it's going to look like, um, and that's a very difficult one to answer. And whether it's, it's, it's a bad one or a good one, um, we can all work on it, right? Beca I'm, but as you're saying, because of all of these in economic interconnections and the debt, um, can we actually negotiate? <coughs> Do we have the power to negotiate? And to me, the most scary part in this song 
is the third a verse where you actually, you know, have this military equipment walking against you, right? Walking along. It's really scary. And this is what we've been seeing in every October 10th uh, inaugurate sort of huge uh, festival that they, they, they ha it's be become grander and grander every year. And so I think there's something to be said about the world revolution not being a dinner party. And, and, and Gordon, do you think there is a plan, there is a, a Xi Jinping plan for the world stage and the levers to I think in it? Increasingly there is, and I think, I think it's, around, I mean, it's around saying to the you know, post-World War II institutions, either evolve or, or will make you irrelevant by setting up parallel institutions, and AIB is you know, one small step in that direction. You know, I think IMF is try, trying to evolve, but I suspect most of the global t historic institutions for the last 70 years will be way too slow in adapting and things like you know, the Shanghai Security Group, the African Partnership out of China, those will become more and more meaningful. And, and is that a good thing? <laughs> I think it's an inevitable thing. Um, in, 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 the, in, the way, in the way in the way that we're headed, and I agree with the, the speaker that the you know the, the 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 fiscal resources to back that, um, and even if you pursue a model through domestic economic strategy, you still have the resources and the economic heft through through trade and and, and, and global and, and, and global political influence at this point to to, to move forward on these. Reform, reforming multilateral institutions. David. Uh, yes, of course. Um, Xi Jinping uh, um, is very keen to make sure that the people in China can see him leading his country to greater and greater prominence in the international world stage. When he came for a state visit, and was put in a golden carriage with a queen going up the Mao. Um, that was beamed all over China nonstop. And that was a symbol of how a great nation like Britain is showing reverence uh, to China. So it, it is, in fact, um, something, and you'll notice that that, um, that they're much more engaged, not only in the apex of the world of meetings, but also sending uh, peacekeeping forces to obscure places that they have not done before. So that, that is definitely uh, happening. And, um, and, and, and we know why, because they want, Xi Jinping wants people to believe that he is bringing China onto the world state and making it into a, a numero uno uh, country. Uh, and, and that's, that's understandable. Um, Michelle is telling me that it's, t it's time. I just want to call two, two, oh, I'm, so, I'm, so, one more question. Let's take that one more question. I feel, I feel bad for not getting to more of you on the floor with the questions, I apologize. Mr. Fenby has had his hand up a very long time. Okay. He's a, we'll a, very, okay. a very sagacious uh, <laughs> China watcher. Okay, I I think, no, yeah, um, he, he, if we His face he, is getting redder and no, redder. The, he is a hidden communist. <laughs> <laughs> it's well um, hidden, though. Okay, if we, we must Xi hear Jinping, from him. David, shut um, up. If Xi Jinping is not next king, will Xi Jinping become next Jiang Jingguo for China? I mean, Jiang Jingguo is Jiang kai the son. Um, he ending 40 years the martial law in Taiwan and the leading um, Western the value democracy in Taiwan. Will this happen a uh, surprise the U-turn quiet the revolution? A good question. Let's just take a, should we take a yes or a no to keep it brief? Um, <laughs> David, a yes or a no, are we going to see um, uh, Jiang Jingguo, a, a figure, emerge? Si, is it, the question was, is, is it going to be Xi Jinping, Jinping isn't it? Or is he going to be China's as, and lead a democratic revolution, perhaps after the next party congress no. in 2017. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid no. <laughs> no, thank God. No. no. <laughs> well, I think that's actually a very good question to put to the floor. Does, uh, does, does anyone in this room believe that uh, Xi Jinping is going to, perhaps after the next party congress, uh, lead China as Jiang Jingguo or Gorbachev in, a, a, in an attempt at a democratic direction? Hands up if you believe that that's likely. <laughs> 
seeds of hope down in this corner. Um, <laughs> All right, Jonathan Fenby, um, seeing as David Tang insists that you have a question. No, 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 it's not the right <laughs> <laughs> Okay, no question. Going back to the economy, you spoke about the opening of the fall, you know, the economy. Why don't you get the mic and say that and say it, say it um, succinctly for us? <clears throat> Sorry, it may not be the, the, the best last question to ask, but going back to the economy which is the basis of everything since Deng Xiaoping, the Communist Party's uh, claim to legitimacy, etc. And given the retrograde nature of the economic reform, so-called reform agenda since the third plenum, and particularly the new five-year plan, if, going back to what in a sense, Gordon was saying at the beginning, is all this feasible if the result of revolution is a zombie economy uh, which just concentrates on paying off the interest every time, cannot accept modernization, cannot accept reform, and the private sector, which is where all the jobs and all the growth comes from, doesn't get a fair share of that, and in the end isn't the next stage of economic uh, growth and modernization in China incompatible with Xi's bottom line, which is the preservation of Communist Party monopoly power. This is, a, this is a good last question. I want everyone in the room to hold it in their mind because I want a show of hands from everybody after the panel have had a very brief, preferably yes or no or not much longer say. Gordon. That was a yes, no question. Uh, uh, I totally, totally agree with Jonathan that you know, it, it comes down to, to economics. Um, and I think there's a, there's a there's, there's a whole range for Xi Jinping of slow growth to faster growth, and it's about the pace of direction of travel. It's not about the direction of travel. I mean, even with no quote-unquote reforms being implemented right now, there is underlying movement towards being a more consumer-driven economy and the like. Yes, the allocation of capital has to get fixed, and I'd say that is the overarching thing, that he needs to decide whether he's taking that on um, now or after the whole thing breaks. No, but that's not answer the question. As I understand it, the question was, the question, the question was, given his political bottom line, John would tell me if I've got this right or not, given his political bottom lines, is this zombified economy, as Jonathan put it, is it going to get sorted? Yes, why are you, it why was are you, a yes why are you no making question. us answer the question now? That's right. <laughs> uh, um, there's going to be parts of China that are going to be long-term zombie economies, and you can go visit bits of it now. It's role modeling itself out in Northeast China. <laughs> Thank you, Barbara. I cannot answer the zombie question at all, but I'm going to say something about the economic base, and I think to go back to what we were discussing in the very beginning, it shows clearly you are stating Deng Xiaoping as the beginning of economy being the base. But the economic base is the Marxist <laughs> belief, right, from the very beginning. That's the base and there is the superstructure. And the fact that Mao somehow didn't, didn't quite get that proves what I said earlier. Marxism is not, in the way it was practiced in China under Mao, is not a Western import. Thank you. That's two <laughs> failures to give me a yes or a no. David. <laughs> Marx is not a foreign import. Remember that. Um, if I've understood Jonathan uh, uh, correctly, I agree with him that uh, you know, if Xi Jinping were to go, go back to controlling more state um, enterprises and so forth, uh, it might well be a retrograde step and therefore reduce the economy, which in fact was, 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 the, was the strength and the triumph of the opening of China and, and its eventual success. But not only do I agree, but in fact, within China, we've got to realize the way in which the world is moving. There are now 800,000 robots in China today. And that displaces more or less on average of four people, three and a half million people working. By 2020, there probably is going to be about five million robots in China, and that would replace 20 million. So we've got to understand the inevitable global movement of how things are going to be done. People are going to be working less and less, they're going to find it more difficult to find jobs, and they're going to have a longer retirement age as we grow 
older and older, our longevity is increasing. And these are the questions which are going to impinge on the economy, quite apart from the fact that if you want to go back to the old days, there's a huge danger. So there's a double danger here, double jeopardy. Thank you. And so let's just put this to the floor, if we can. Um, so given that the question, as I understood it, is the, boss, the political bottom lines of Xi Jinping being what we all pretty much in this room agree that they are, is the economy fixable to take China to the next stage and to its great power ambitions? Uh, who believes that the answer to that is yes? That's not many people. And who believes that the answer to that is no, that the politics is getting in the way of China's economic great power status? And that's the, that's, I, it's hard for me to judge. I'd say that's, m I don't, I don't, I don't know. More, yes. More. Although it's not, it's not entirely decisive. Terrible <laughs> voting behavior in this country, I must say. No, but a lot of people are shy. <laughs> Yeah, they need a secret ballot. <laughs> Make it compulsory. Make it compulsory. You have to raise your hands. Make it compulsory. We're on the subject of dictatorship. Make it compulsory. <laughs> And make the answers compulsory as well. Well, I think it's just that I framed the question badly. That's the problem. <laughs> anyway, thank you all so much. The panel, you've been fantastic and a wonderful audience. Thank you so much for this evening. All right, put over your moderator. Thank you all for coming. On behalf of the South China Institute, this is what we're here for. This kind of discussion, debate, dialogue, amongst people from so many different constituencies right here in the middle of London. This is what we want to do again and again and again. Uh, sadly, it won't be me doing it anymore from next year onwards, uh, but I've had a wonderful time. Thank you for your support. And most of all, please let's thank once again our wonderful moderator and our wonderful panelists. Thank you. Thank you.